appreciate the warm introduction. Uh, this session is about digital disruption and uh, the effect that it has on all of us. Uh, digital disruption is changing everything, and uh, how we prepare for that and how we react to it is, uh, is really up to us, whether or not we take advantage of it or whether we're scared of it, how we use it, and it's some of these issues that I'd really like to tease out uh, from the panel uh, this morning. And so I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, I have uh, Minister Pichet uh, from Thailand. He is the uh, Minister of Digital Economy and Society. We also have with us uh, Elsie Kanza, who is the head of Africa for the World Economic Forum. And finally, we have uh, Wilja Lubi, who is the uh, Deputy Secretary General of Economic Development uh, in Estonia. So all of these people are leaders in their field, dealing with digital disruption at a very high level on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Dave Moskowitz. I'm the country manager for the Global Entrepreneurship Network in New Zealand. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, an investor, professional company director, and I'm uh, very involved in accelerators, which are accelerating digital disruption. So thank you very much, panelists. I guess I'd like to start by um, asking the question to each of our panelists, is what do you see as the main digital disruptors over the medium term, and what do you think their impacts are going to be on our daily lives? Mr. Pichet. Uh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave, uh, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from my perspective, especially from a developing country in Southeast Asia, the way I look at uh, disruption, and it's, uh, it's not only digital technologies, d disruption in, in many other technologies and many other business uh, sectoral disruptions as well. The way we look at it uh, uh, in our government is that we certainly would have to be quick enough to be responsive to the disruption that is taking place uh, in a way uh, to be able to uh, prevent uh, the existing uh, infrastructure as well as the existing business uh, to be able to go on uh, healthily. Uh, but on the other hand, use disruption as the opportunities for new ventures, uh, and especially a number of ventures that we are facing today, providing opportunities for, for the young generation uh, to, to be startups and entrepreneurs. Let me very briefly uh, uh, say that uh, we look it, at it as a two-pronged approach. Uh, first, uh, as a government, we need to be clearer than before because things are moving so fast uh, about our guidelines, our flagships, our milestones, and our policy. For example, today we are uh, uh, telling the public as well as our international friends that we are entering the so-called, I'm from Thailand, the so-called Thailand 4.0. Uh, you, you can have any number you want, uh, but, but, but the, the essence of this message is that we, we have a mountain to climb, we have a ladder to climb. Some may climb from 1.0 to 2.0, some from 2 to 4 as leapfrogging. Uh, but that's not enough. We also need to identify because a government needs to have some kind of focus to be able to get the public to move into the same direction. So, for example, we have identified five industrial clusters, that some of which are new S-curves, so that the country can move to another level. We also need very much to get the private sector on board. We are now having groups and groups of public-private sectors led by the private sector in order to look into public policy for the first time. And we also certainly have to provide uh, ecosystem and incentives, especially tax and investment privileges, uh, so that those startups or those SMEs will be able to, to start their businesses. So that's number one the clarity of government policy. And the important thing is to have good plans, but more importantly, to have good implementation. So with uh, regard to digital disruption, let me just very briefly say, uh, to put uh, those nice targets into dig digital actions 
we are looking into opportunities, especially for those uh, who are disadvantaged. For example, at the village, at the rural agricultural sectors uh, that need a lot of opportunities. We are now deploying e-commerce platforms uh, so that the fiber optics for broadband that we are currently installing to 24,000 villages throughout the country within 12 months will be attached with e-commerce so that villagers, for the first time, will be able to do business, to sell their local products through e-marketplace, through e-logistics, and through e-payment, something that digital disruption can enhance the, the have-nots, uh, the disadvantage to be able to catch up using the technology for the first time to increase their level of income. And together with e-commerce, we certainly can work with the public sector, for example, the uh, public health, uh, in order to install e-health within this fiber optics also. So many nice things that can happen. So, could, so if we can move on sure. to some of the other speakers, you've mentioned fiber optics and e-health mm -hmm. as being some of the key, disruptor, key disruptors coming, coming along. How about you, Elsie? What, what, what do you think is going to be uh, affecting people most in the medium term? So if we start off with the, with the big picture, uh, the World Economic Forum since about January last year has been making an effort to really um, enable people to understand and come to terms with what's happening with new technologies, how it's disrupting our lives, our economies, businesses. Um, and in that respect, something that is increasingly clear is that policy is lagging behind technology. So one of the major disruptors really is for policy to become a lot more agile, for the environments to become much more flexible because technology continues to evolve. Um, and in this regard, we've actually opened a, a center for the fourth industrial revolution, which is bringing together different people um, from the public sector and private sector um, to think about what this means for the world, not just um, for Africa, which I'm responsible for, for example. The second key area of disruptions, apart from the governance side, is that um, these new technologies are bringing new possibilities. So whether it's the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, um, 3D printing, drones, blockchain. And I very often get the question about whether this is relevant for Africa, right? Should we be talking about the fourth industrial revolution when we're still stuck in the first industrial revolution? Um, I think that's the wrong question. These are technologies that are impacting us as people globally. We, we're reaching a point where we're having to figure out whether it's man or woman versus machine, how much is, can be done by, uh, by machines, and therefore, what does <coughs> it mean for human beings going forward? And this is something that the entire world is grappling with. In the particular context of Africa, what is striking is that we're very much at the forefront of being actively engaged in developing these new technologies. And at least from the forum's perspective, we want more diversity because the world is not just just San Francisco, for example. And what's key is <laughs> what is the impact, right? The, the drivers or incentives for developing new technologies, innovation, entrepreneurship varies depending on the context that you're in. So everyone needs to participate in this process. And the last aspect, which is critical, again, taking into account um, the differences of our context is that um, it's estimated that nine out of 10 Africans are in the informal economy. So when we talk about innovations, what kind of uh, innovations can we foster that are relevant to the bottom of the pyramid in particular? And in this regard, again, we're seeing quite a bit of learning sort of south-south. Uh, for example, the promotion of grassroots innovations um, in India, they call it the Jugad innovation, but you also have Gambiara in Brazil. So what does it mean um, for governments and, and big business as well to be able to foster grassroots innovations that um, address the needs of the poor while also involving them and empowering them to come up with their own solutions? Excellent. I want to come back to several of those points later on, especially around um, agile policy, which is a phrase that I love and um, the uh, fourth industrial revolution, and whether we can just jump straight from the first and skip the second and third. But so, uh, William, tell me, what keeps you up at night uh, worrying about being disrupted and, uh, and how to harness that disruption in a positive way? Thank you, Dave. To answer your question about who are the disruptors, then the short answer is private sector. 
I think they are on the driver, driver's seat and they remain there. But I think that the governments can do a lot. And uh, I, I can bring two uh, concrete examples from the practice but to, from, from our country. In late 90s, then Estonia introduced e-government. So in 1999, our cabinet meetings were paperless. That time it was a luxury. It wasn't something that you know, everybody had. Like today, that e-government is a necessity. That time it wasn't. And, uh, but actually, what drove us there was a necessity. If you come from a small Nordic country that is sparsely populated, then running a country is a costly business. So how to make it cheaper? And how do you have cuts in development? So we thought that you know, uh, taking uh, services online is something that you know, we really can cut costs and can bring citizens close to the government quickly. So, I mean, the rest is history, as to say. Now we uh, have 4,000 plus services online. Private sector is you know, adding up services quickly. We sign all the documents digitally. We, uh, we have e-voting, the uh, only country in the world that you can have general elections online. But then we thought another thing that, you know, where government can be a disruptor. As Estonia is small and our e-government is actually quite effective and efficient, we thought why we limit ourselves within our national borders. Yes, as a part of the European Union, we try to exp extend it so that all the EU member states have a similar systems. At least you can do many things online because it's efficient. But two years ago, Estonia introduced e-residency. Uh, just, you know, a short course what e-residence means, that this is the first time you get the government-backed online identity. So that each, each one of you can become e-resident and then uh, communicate with the government online. You can, open a, 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 you can open a company in Estonia remotely from a laptop here within 20 minutes. You can do the tax, uh, taxes from here, you can sign documents here, you can uh, uh, attend a board meeting in Estonia through Skype, another Estonian invention. So the point is, we really want to go and disrupt. What it means, actually, we are going to somebody else's uh, playing ground. Right now, we go to I mean, South Africa, I mean, uh, Fr France, whoever's playground, meaning that we provide our governmental services online. So in a way, we are disrupting. Eventually, of course, we hope that, you know, in every country, the governmental system can be extremely smooth and efficient. And then, of course, Estonia might lose its uh, competitive advantage. But overall, we all benefit because trade is global. This is one, one example. And very shortly, another example is from the past, from the future. Right now, Estonia has a big problem in our economy, shortage of people. We just don't have enough people for our labor, labor market. So the first, of course, say, come to Estonia. We, uh, we need bright people. But secondly, we thought we right now we're preparing a program that some of the governmental services that actually need people, we want to use uh, chatbots. So that, you know, again, we, we, we think this is something and a good example that you can disrupt the market. But I said, you know, the conclusion that uh, I think that the private sector is the one that really disrupts the market. That's good. So the trick then is how, to, how do you turn government into an enabler uh, rather than an obstacle for encouraging private sector and encouraging everyone in the, in, the, in the economy to participate and benefit from that digital disruption. I just want to add, I, I really love the e-residence plan so much so that I, I signed up last night myself. It only took me 15 minutes, not 20 minutes, and um, you know, I would highly encourage everyone here to, uh, to give it a go. Um, the only problem is I have to go to Tallinn to, uh, pick, up my, uh, to pick up my car. No, no, you have to go to the closest embassy. My closest no, no, no. embassy is in Sydney, unfortunately, <laughs> so I'd rather go to Tallinn anyway. <laughs> let, Dave, let me uh, elaborate a little bit about uh, e-government. I, mm -hmm. I think everybody in the room knows the, the impact of how a more efficient government through electronic means uh, uh, implies. Uh, but lately, we have come uh, to term that uh, looking at the government regulations, we probably can get rid of hundreds if not thousands of regulations that are barriers to private sector ease of doing business, to uh, uh, facilitating uh, government service to the public and so on. So for example, now we have a program called regulatory guillotine to chop, chop, chop and get rid of all those unnecessary uh, 
uh, together in parallel with uh, uh, another track of ease of doing business regime so that we can provide a more systematic and efficient uh, uh, government uh, deregulation or soft regulation for the private sector to, to, to run, operate their businesses. That's great. So, I mean, the, the question then is really how do we disrupt government itself and use these same tools to make government much more responsive to the people and make people have much more buy-in to the government? As an example, in New Zealand, we're running a, a GovTech accelerator where we establish little public-private sector limited liability companies to execute on problems that governments find really difficult and sort of outsource the risk to the private sector while public sector can claim the gains. Um, what are the specific policy instruments are, are, are people doing around the world to help encourage that disruption of government? Elsie, you... Uh... Well, I was just going to build on um, the Honorable Minister's previous uh, mm -hmm. description of uh, e-government services and citing the example of Rwanda which has very much taken a systemic approach to embracing a digital economy and to develop entrepreneurs in the process. And um, I think very often we hear governments talk about taking the digital route without necessarily thinking about how it could use the digitization process to foster entrepreneurship and, and build up the capabilities um, of SMEs and, and local entrepreneurs. And, and Rwanda is one example of that. So as you digitize your services, how do you also use that as a way of helping your local entrepreneurs build their technical and technological capabilities, but also grow them as, as enterprises? Hmm. Well, yeah, you yes. Have anything <coughs> First of all, I, I would just say that I'm also a big fan of uh, New Zealand's governmental uh, accelerator Thing. I think it's great, and we really want to copy it in Estonia. But you know what you ask is extremely important, and uh, probably my answer is quite manifold. I think the key aspect is the trust. Trust is so important these days, especially everything concerning digital. That whom to trust is the key issue. And if you if you take the e-government, then uh, we had this discussion in uh, in the mid 90s that you have only two options. You either trust your government or trust the private sector. Because somebody needs to have this uh, information. And we decided that we trust our government more. But of course, you have to have checks and balances in place. And now comes, you know, I think, you know, the major thing that we really have to push forward globally is the personal data protection issue. And we think that the main uh, criteria, how to do it, is that you have to answer the question, who owns the data? And uh, in Estonia, we believe that you should own the data about you. And then every, everything uh, comes into place. That if I own the data that government has about me, I can always question the government, why do you have this data about me? But also, why this private sector company has the data about me? Because this is, this is so crucial. And now has how governments, then if uh, data is so transparent, then citizens can always ask, you know, why government is not uh, efficient enough? Because you know exactly what it has about you and what it hasn't but and how it uses the data. And also, I mean, it works both way. If government has the data and you own the data, then uh, government by definition should be enabler. Why? Because private sector and you cannot blame them. They want to uh, collect as much data as they have, build their business on it, and then keep the status quo. Because, you know, they want to have dominant position. Governments with uh, transparency can actually create a level playing field for everybody. And that's why it's great because, you know, they really can help the government, uh, the market to, to, to work properly. Otherwise, you might have a dominant players. But if it's very transparent, then you lose your advantage by just keeping the, the data as, as a circuit. So we could get into a really long philosophical discussion about this. And I think one place where the um, data is the new oil analogy falls apart is that data is really part of an economy of abundance. I mean, with oil, you pull it out of the ground, you burn it, and then it's gone, and it pollutes the environment at the same time. But with data, once you have that data, you can continually reuse it, repurpose it, add value to it, morph it into, into many, many different products. But having established that trust, I think, is, is, is really critical so that people know where the ownership boundaries are and who, and, and who has permission to do what. That's a very inexact science at the moment. Yes, that's why I always say, People always ask, you know, if uh, Estonia says uh, about transparency in our system, how about the big brother effect? And of course, you always say the same thing, you know, just think, the analog world. 
if you have all the, all the data on, on paper somewhere in the files, you can never be sure who checked your data. Never. At least in, in cyberspace, there is always track left behind. You, can, you cannot hide it. Mm. Dave, uh, from a government point of view, uh, one important aspect that we have to strike a balance all the time is to keep a, a very good balance between dichotomies of things. For example, data, you mentioned about data. Uh, there, there'll be portions of the society who would start looking into the data protection, the privacy issue. So government has to play a very big role in trying to balance that. Uh, and same thing with the uh, uh, innovation, startups, as well as the existing legal infrastructure, Uber, for example. Now we have to look at alternatives, for example, the regulatory sandbox, in order to strike that balance. So it's the kind of thing that government has to be alert all the time to, to make sure that you don't block innovation, but at the same time, you have to deal with the existing legal infrastructure. Sure. So if I have time for one more, one more issue I'd like to raise, and that is that you know, all of the digital disruption is pointing toward more and more automation, people having to do less and less work. And one of the things that, that worries me at night is how do we use that for a force of good in the world and ensure that people have meaningful stuff to do? I mean, the problem that Estonia has is a great one where they don't have enough workers, but I think most, m most, of, the, most of the rest of the world is, is, is finding large portions of their workforce displaced. How do we, what can we do to ensure that the, the, the fruits of digital disruption are really shared equally uh, or beneficially within society? I can go. <laughs> uh, well, one of the major uh, challenges in the, in the African context in particular is access to the internet. So it's one thing to talk about a digital economy, uh, but it's another to be realistic when only 20% of Africans have access to the internet. So the first hurdle is how to bring about universal access. And this calls for collaboration, uh, for sure, between the public and the private sector. And coming up with smart solutions. So, so back to how governments can be disruptive. For example, in Uganda, uh, in October last year, uh, the government decided to provide free Wi-Fi it's on a test basis, so it's primarily in Kampala and Entebbe. But essentially, say the government doesn't work at night. So we're going to use the internet during the day, and then between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., we're going to make it free to the public. Uh, it's primarily focused on a couple of hotspots, but that's one way of saying it's going to take us time to build out the fiber optics that will connect everyone. But then we have unused capabilities. So while we take into account the security considerations, how do we enable more people to already access the internet today, which allows them to participate in the process? Um, concurrently, in the private sector, you also have sort of a disruptive approach to um, providing access where there is none. So for example, the BRIC BRCK innovation in, in Kenya, uh, which essentially started off with creating a brick that provides Wi-Fi access to enable school kids in remote areas to learn and to be able to download data from the cloud. It's not permanently on. It's not connected to the grid, right? Um, it's very hardy. They launched last year, and they're now exporting to 11 countries around the world. So I think it's, we need to open our minds as to what the possibilities are, but we also need to very much start with the basics. I, I, I totally agree. I'm also not too pessimistic. Why? Because of just 200, 200 years, even less ago, I mean, most people living on in in this planet, most of the time they just had to worry about if they can feed their, them, themselves and families, because it, it took 90% of the time. Now it takes much less. People still have uh, many things to do. And these days, as we all know, you know how many hours we spend on uh, doing things that 10, 15 years ago wasn't even on the market. So that you know, if we free up our time uh, from uh, doing things that we, it used to take a long time, then I think we find new, new things to do. But also, it can be extremely useful, what, what Elsie was saying as well. Take, for example, I mean, farming. Farming in so many countries that uh, farmers were also, especially small farmers, they were struggling with, um, let's say, you didn't have the info on market prices. So the middlemen always had a great power over the farmers. Now, you know, if you have a mobile phone, you can bypass the middleman. So in a way, it really benefits everybody. So the answer then lies in reinventing ourselves and how we create value and how we value different things that we can create with the new digital economy. 
Let, let I'll leave the last word to Minister yes, Pichet. Yes, uh, I think it's, it's a big problem. Uh, the re replacement of employment uh, uh, when automation starts to spread uh, throughout uh, many industrial sectors. Uh, I, I think at this point, I can think of three approaches uh, that would prepare the society uh, to, to, to be able to absorb uh, that kind of phenomenon. Number one, certainly education and training has to come very early on. Uh, number two, uh, in Thailand, uh, we have uh, quite a large uh, portion of informal uh, 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 profession. You know? So uh, I, I think uh, from uh, the statistics that we see, to move the people from the informal uh, production sector into the service sector is one way to, to, to create jobs okay, in, in, in the new era. And uh, the, the third one, I think uh, we also need to look at uh, developing country as a contributor to technology development, not just technology consumption alone. And, and that's the leading edge that we also need to look into opportunities wherever possible, for example, IoT. And it's exactly forums like this, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which enable us to work together to the common good on these projects. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is the sort of thing that we could talk about all day, and we do talk about it all day indeed, don't we? Mm -hmm. and, but unfortunately, we're out of time, so. Mm -hmm.